Hi, everyone, and welcome to lecture two of ECE 3311, Principles of Communication Systems. In this lecture, we will talk about the all-important mathematical tool called the Fourier transform. The prerequisites for ECE 3311 are continuous time and discrete time signals and systems. That is where the concept of the Fourier transform should have been introduced. The Fourier transform is so important in this class because what happens is, sure, we can look at the electromagnetic signals that are produced by our communication systems as they are sent to and received from the medium, right, um, in the time domain. You know, we can look at the behavior as a function of t, right? But there's a lot of information that's contained within the frequency domain representation of these signals. In fact, for us to kind of really understand uh, what's going on in terms of how a communication system is operating, in a lot of cases, it's a lot easier to look at it from the frequency domain than in the time domain, right? In fact, in a lot of cases, I think more in the frequency domain when I look at a communication system or I build one or try and debug one uh, than I do in the time domain. So this lecture is going to go over rather briefly what a Fourier transform is, what are the conditions for it to work with a specific function, and then I'm going to point out a couple of really core mathematical functions that I'll be using th frequently throughout the rest of this class, okay? So we're really going to go through kind of like, you know, Fourier transform definition, conditions for it to be valid, several useful functions you should all be very comfortable with, and then I'll do a couple of examples to, to kind of wrap up this lecture. All right. Okay. So first of all, this should be a definition you all um, should have seen, um, uh, you know, uh, in, your, in the class, like a, a continuous or discrete time signals and systems course, right? So here, X of t is, in this case, it's a continuous time function, right? Continuous time function. t denotes uh, the time index. X, um, uh, is, is, uh, X of t is a function of time, right? And this cursive f here, f applied to X of t, means we're taking the Fourier transform of X of t. Okay? And the definition of that is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity with respect to t okay, of x of t multiplied by e to the minus j. j is the complex, um, is a, 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 the comp complex operator. Uh, it's essentially, e it's e equal to the square root of minus one, two pi f. f is the frequency variable times t. Okay, so we have two variables here. We have f of f and we have t. We're integrating with respect to t and the output function, capital X, not lowercase x. Lowercase um, function uh, uh, labels like uh, usually denote a continuous time function, right? Like while uppercase variables, right, like big X represent the frequency function of, of, of a waveform, right? So this here, okay x of f, big X of f, represents the frequency representation of little x of t, the, the, uh, the continuous time waveform, right? And then, very importantly, we can also get from the frequency domain, we have something called the inverse Fourier transform, where f, cursive f to the minus one of x of f yields x of t, and it's represented by this expression here, right? So these two functions, right? This equation here, equation one and equation two, should be seared into your memories. These two are gonna be really important throughout the rest of this course, because this will allow you to take time domain representations, convert them into frequency domain, study them, understand them, manipulate them, mathematically work with them, and then be able to convert back to the time domain. All right, the conditions, 
When can we use the Fourier transform applied to a waveform X of T? There's something called the Dirichlet conditions. There are two. First, during any finite interval, time interval for X of T, okay, it, uh, X of T is a single valued finite number of mi maxima and minima, and the number of discontinuities is finite. Right? So that's the first thing. So first of all, we do not have, uh, as like, you know, it, it basically it is what it is. Take a time interval, let's say T1 to T2 of X of T, and it has to have a finite number of peaks and valleys. And if there are any discontinuities, there cannot be an infinite number of them. The second one, oh, and the second one's kind of a biggie, is that the waveform X of T must be absolutely inter integrable. What does that mean? If I integrate the absolute value of X of T from minus infinity to infinity, it cannot blow up. It can never equal or can never approach infinity. It's got to be something finite valued. Okay, so those two conditions for X of T, any X of T, must satisfy them for a Fourier transform to work. Now, there's a couple of other cool things about uh, Fourier transforms. So suppose we get the frequency representation of, of a time domain waveform, right? So what happens is with that frequency representation, if we take that frequency representation and potentially, and in a lot of cases, that frequency representation is represented by a complex function, right? It has imaginary and has real components. What happens is if I multiply that complex function, that frequency representation with the complex conjugate of itself, it gives us something, it gives us the magnitude squared, right? Of that frequency representation. It's a real valued function. In fact, what that gives us is something called the energy spectral density, right? It's the energy that is distributed as a function of f from minus infinity to infinity. So, so it kind of makes sense. So whereas the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the frequency representation, I don't want to call it a, an amplitude, but uh, the, uh, like, you know, the, the, if you have the frequency representation, now you take the square, okay, the magnitude squared of that representation, it's kind of like, you know, if you think of like Ohm's law and the relationship between voltage and power, it's a square relationship. You can kind of like, you know, draw an analogy there with respect to this, this expression here. The magnitude squared of your frequency representation gives you the energy distribution across the frequency domain from minus infinity to infinity. And then there's also something called Parseval's theorem, which is represented by equation five which is if I take two time domain functions, W1 of T and the complex conjugate of W2 of T, multiply them together and integrate them from minus infinity to infinity, wow, the frequency representation, the Fourier transforms of those two functions multiplied together and their integral taken from minus infinity to infinity across frequency should be equivalent. Really cool. Huh. And then finally, there's something called Rayleigh's energy theorem, which is if you take the energy spectral density and you integrate it across all frequency, it gives you, listen for this, the total energy contained within that signal. So think about it. Energy spectral density. It is a density. It is the amount of energy spread across the entire spectral domain across all frequency. What happens if you integrate across all frequency? You get the total energy of that signal. Cool. That is a nice behavior I would like to see, right? Uh, whenever I take the Fourier transform of a signal. Now, here are several functions you're gonna see an awful lot of in ECE 3311. You're gonna see something called the Delta Dirac function, right? So the Delta Dirac function, um, 
is basically that the, if you've seen if you've taken the continuous and discrete time signals and systems classes that's that little arrow thingy that occurs at one point okay across the time domain and everything else is zero that's a delta dirac function unit step is let's say at a specific transition point everything before that transition point is zero everything after that transition point is one in this case, u of t is zero for all time values less than zero and is equal to one for all time values greater than zero. And then finally, my favorite is the rectangular pulse. We're going to see lots of rectangular pulse functions here. And rectangular pulse functions is essentially a rectangular wave, right? Let, let's actually draw this. And what's really cool about this is that if you take the Fourier transform of a rectangular pulse, it produces something called a sync function. Not S-I-N-K, but S-I-N-C, sync, right? So let's take a look, okay? Okay. Um, where is my pen? Ah, here we go. So what, what are they again? Delta function. So what a delta function is, oh, let me try and draw this better. Take two. Yes, that's it. So a delta function looks like this. So what this means is that I have at t equals zero, a non zero value of which is the delta function and then for t not equal to zero everything else everything else is equal to zero all right equal to zero equal to zero what happens if i have delta t minus t naught Well, what happens is the argument in the, Dirac, in the delta function, argument, this has to be equal to zero at some point. What makes, what value of t makes the argument of the delta function equal to zero? t equals t naught. So at value t naught, that's, well, that's where the non-zero value of the delta function occurs. And everything else is zero. All right, next, or as they say in French, prochain, is the unit step function. So u of t is this. So let's say that goes to plus infinity and that goes to minus infinity. So at zero, the unit step function is zero. And then at, at zero, oh, sorry, before zero, everything's zero. After zero, whoop, it creates a step, right? Looks like a step, step. And it has a value, an amplitude value of one. That's a unit step function. Last but not least, the rectangular, rectangular function, FCN, looks like this, right? So at zero, oh, and sorry, um, this goes to infinity, but this, this guy, this, uh, the x index is um, uh, sorry, the horizontal index, that's with respect to time, folks. The rectangular function, right, looks like this fella here, right? And this we'll see a lot. We'll see a lot of this, especially with baseband digital representations. And what's interesting, right, with this rectangular pulse, and we usually represent this we usually represent this in terms of the following. Ah, shucks, I just lost my, ah, there we go. Ha, ha, ha. 
we represent it like the following. Do, 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 t over t. So from minus t over two to t over two has an amplitude value of one. And everything else is zipperino, right? What's really cool, oh, what's so cool about this is that if you take the Fourier transform, right? Cursive F denotes the Fourier transform. This gives us something called the sink function. And the sink function almost looks like a sign, right? It's centered at zero, but it looks like it diminishes. Ah, let me redraw that. That, that doesn't look great. Yes, that's it. has this sort of graceful decay. That is a sink function, right? And the crossings, right? Uh, the crossings, uh, well, that's, that's, they usually, they are a function, they are a function of like one over t. They occur, so what's interesting about the sink function, what's interesting about the sink function is this. So here, this is a non-zero value. First crossings at minus one over t, I'm uh, sorry, plus one over t, minus one over t, zero, two over t, and minus two over t, zero, 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 zero. So periodically it's non-zero, uh, sorry, zero values, except for here. This will pay big dividends later on, all right? So there's that beautiful relationship between the sink function and the rectangular, in the frequency domain, and in the time domain, the rectangular pulse. So let's do a couple of examples. Like let's, because like what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little bit of a refresher the type of mathematics that you should be all comfortable with, uh, it, uh, because we're gonna see a lot more of this in this course, all right? So let's do an example. So the first example, oops. <laughs> Suppose I have a function. Oh, look at this. Okay, cool. What's, what's its, it is, what's its frequency response? Okay. AKA, AKA, doot, 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 doot. what is V, I'm getting sloppy. What is V of F? So V of F, is going to be equal to, in this case, the Fourier transform, minus infinity to infinity of V of T, correct? E to the minus J, two pi, right? F of T, DT. So we're integrating with respect to T, W, R, T, with respect to T. We're integrating with that. Right? Notice that the output should be a function of f. We have that variable there. Awesome sauce. So let's plug it in. V of f is equal to from minus infinity to infinity. Let's replace v of t, a cosine 2 pi f naught of t e to the minus j 2 pi f of t dt. Uh, heartburn. What do we do? Okay, so this is something I think when I, when I taught uh, discrete time signals and systems, I brought this up over and over and over and over and over again. Euler's relations. Very, very super duper important. So what's the first one? So Euler's relations. So cos, all right, of omega naught. Hmm, 
No, let's not do omega. 2 pi f t is going to be equal to e to the j 2 pi f naught t plus e to the minus j 2 pi f naught t. Let's put f naught there. Over 2. Sine is going to be equal to my e to the j 2 pi f naught t minus e to the minus j 2 pi f naught t divided by 2j. Again, remember, j is equal to the square root of minus 1. If you're a mathematician, usually you label it as i, okay? Let's replace this. So we take a out because it's a constant. And so let's use Euler's relation here, replace that guy. Let's actually take out the two that's going to, well, no, no, let's, let's one step at a time. So it's going to be j 2 pi f naught of t plus e to the minus j 2 pi f naught of t over 2 e to the minus j 2 pi f of t dt. All righty. Let's do a little bit of reorganization here. Let's do a reorg. So I want to create one integral expression that's surrounded around that plus an integral expression surrounded by that. No problemo. This is what we're going to do. Do, 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 do. First of all, I'm going to take two, put it on the outside, right? So now I have a over two brackets, j minus pi, uh, sorry, minus infinity to infinity, e to the j two pi f naught of t, e to the minus j two pi f of t, dt, right? Plus, because remember, an integral is a linear operator. Minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus j 2 pi f naught of t, e to the minus j 2 pi f of t, dt. Close brackets. Awesome. Let's play around with this a little bit more. So what happens is we notice common base. Let's merge the exponents together. So now we have a over two brackets, minus infinity to infinity, e, and it's gonna be j, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's do minus two pi, and then brackets, f minus f naught of t, dt, plus minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus j two pi, f plus f naught t, dt. This is awesome. This is totally awesome. Why? Because what ends up happening is now we have something this here, it's interesting. This has a shift by minus F naught. This has a shift by plus F naught. Now, what ends up happening when we just do the minus infinity? Okay. We do minus infinity to infinity, E. Uh, to the minus j, 2 pi f of t dt. What's that? Any guesses? So what happens is here, let's say you put 1, right? What is this equal to? Delta f. There's our delta function, right? So now... We almost have the same thing, except that now it's not f, but f minus f naught and f plus f naught. So now my v of f 
is equal to a over 2 delta f minus f naught plus delta f plus f naught. Very super duper important. Yes. So what does this tell me? I now have vf. Let's look at it. I'm going to draw it. It's easier for me to draw. At minus f naught and at f naught delta, boop, delta, boop. And it has amplitude a over 2, a over 2. That is VF, folks. And remember I was talking about wonk, 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 pass band, wonk, 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 bass band, right? So what happens is a bass band signal has a frequency representation that occurs around here. Pass band representation usually is a, well, not usually, is a signal which is located at a non-zero carrier frequency, in this case, f naught and minus f naught. So keep this in mind. And I chose cosine very intentionally because we'll be using that or its derivatives for the modulation from baseband to passband. Okay, very, very super duper important. Just as an FYI, what I, I did ask, what is the frequency response, right? And right now you say, okay, VF is equal to that. Okay, cool beans, draw it for me. All right. The way you would, again, what would be the, when we talk about frequency responses, there's a magnitude response. And then there is a phase response. So for VF, what is the magnitude response? The magnitude response, this fella here, is the square root of the real, okay, the real component of VF squared plus the imaginary component of VF squared summed together square root. The phase response of VF is going to be equal to the arctan of the imaginary component of VF divided by the real component of VF. So those are going to be two very important factors. All right, second sort of refresher question. Okay, so the second one is, you know that rectangular, uh, rectangular pulse thingy? All right, well, let's prove it. Let's prove it that's equal to a sync function. All righty, so um, remember, Rectangular, which is represented by this here. This is, uh, you have lowercase pi and you have uppercase pi. Yeah, so the Greeks also had lowercase and uppercase, right? So this is uppercase pi. Uppercase pi. So recall what this looks like. boop and boop, right? Centered at zero and it has height one. What is the Fourier transform of this thing? Okay, so let's say I give this thing, um, I call it again, let's call it G of T. So G of F is going to be equal to the Fourier transform of G of T, which is going to be equal to from minus infinity to infinity g of t e to the minus j 2 pi f t dt. Okay, integral with respect to t. Hmm, interesting. It's zero for values less than minus t over 2 and greater, greater than t over 2. Very interesting. So how can we use that? 
we can kind of make the limits of integration a little bit more simple here. So cool. So what we do is the following. So what happens is if I'm integrating something that's gonna be zero anyway, why bother? So what I do is I say, I'm going to only integrate the part that's non-zero of that function. So the only part of g of t that's going to be a non-zero value. What's that? From minus t over two, to t over two, g of t in that limit of integration is one, e to the j minus j two pi f of t dt. Ha, huh, so cool. Because now let's in integrate this thing. What do we get? So if we integrate this thing with respect to t, what I get at the end of the day is I'm gonna have e to the minus j two pi f of t divided by what? Divided by, um, let's see, I don't wanna mess up my in, in limits of integration here. So I'm integrating with respect to t, so I'm gonna have minus j, 2 pi f. All right, cool beans. And I now need to evaluate the result of this integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2. Okay, cool. So now, uh, what does that look like? Uh, well, what, what it will look like is something like this. This is going to be equal to minus j 2 pi f. Hmm. Uh, and then it's going to be equal to uh, e to the minus j 2 pi f, okay? And what's the, other, what's the other one? It's going to be equal to, and then subtract, e to the minus j 2 pi f minus. Okay, so far so good. Everyone with me? All right, so what I've just done is I started evaluating this integral or the, the result of the integral with respect to the limits. Yay, so this is what I get. Now, um, we know that this is gonna be equal to j two pi f t over two. Now, um, I see Euler all over this thing. Like seriously, very much so. So first of all, let's do a little bit of reordering. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to switch positions and I'm gonna multiply the top and bottom by minus, right? So what I'm gonna end up getting is I'm gonna get e to the j. So I'm gonna move this here and this fellow here. Actually, let's, let's not do that quite yet. Let's do this, yeah? So I move that minus, sorry, plus. So I all I did is I just moved the exponents to different positions. Then I said, you know what? I don't like that minus there, that plus there, that minus there. What do I do? Multiply the top and bottom by negative. So now this becomes a plus, this becomes a minus, that becomes a plus. Cool, awesome. So now I got e to the j two pi f t over two minus e j Okay, and I got j2 pi f. Now, uh, this is looking pretty darn good. One problem. So Euler, remember what Euler's relation for sine is. This almost is that. It's almost that. Um, but the, the denominator is, uh, sorry, num the denominator is missing something. It's missing a t over two. So what's the trickaroo? The trickaroo is I'm going to divide 
this entire expression by t over two, and I'm gonna multiply the whole expression by t over two. So what's my favorite saying? I'm doing nothing, but I'm doing a lot because now what do I have? Well, what I end up getting, okay, uh, when, when you're looking at this is your, your, it's almost a sine function, right? Um, so, so what ends up happening is when you do this, uh, this representation, actually also, I don't like the two. Hmm. Well, actually the two goes away anyway. Yeah, because boop, 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 boop. Okay, that's cool. That's super cool. So now, uh, what do I have? Um, nee, 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 nee. So what do we have? So yeah, so ultimately what we're gonna get with the Euler's relation is we're gonna get a sine x over x term, right? Because of, because of what we're doing right here, right now. So what we end up getting, oops, wrong color, is we've gotten this far. We know by Euler, okay, that this is gonna look like, like what? So this is gonna look like the, the following. It's gonna look like sine pi f big T, right? We did all that canceling out stuff, right? Um, we, uh, we're also gonna have this guy out here, T, right? Uh, and then what ends up happening is we have all this stuff in the bottom here. So all we care about, yeah, so see this two does hang out with that J and that's what forms along with this stuff here creates the sine function because of Euler. We have this T that's hanging out here and then we have this denominator stuff. So we have pi, F T. This is actually pretty darn important because what this looks like is sine X over X. That folks is the definition of sync. Right? So sync, just as an aside, sync of X is equal to sine X over x. All right. So this is just a sample of the type of mathematics you should be comfortable with. And we're going to be, so, so really the signals and systems mathematics that you, you've taken in the past is going to be really applicable throughout this course. And this, is, this lecture is really kind of getting you accustomed to the Fourier transform techniques, kind of the tricks. Remember, there are a lot of tricks when you do these Fourier transforms. So hopefully this is jogging your memory a little bit. We also have a lot of practice problems that are available uh, through the course Canvas site. So definitely check them out. And of course, attend my office hours, ask me more questions. But hopefully this lecture kind of like, again, um, you know, brought back memories of those past courses and really practice makes perfect. You can never practice enough uh, with these types of derivations. And you're gonna be using this a lot throughout this course. So with that, folks, uh, this concludes lecture number two of ECE 3311.